Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this last episode of La Mort d'Arthur tonight. Sir Tristram is sent to fetch your wife for King Mark. Hello, 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 Danny. Welcome. Welcome. Happy, happy Monday to you. How are you? I am, of course, very well. Chilling out um, over in Yorkshire. Looking forward to this week's episodes. Looking forward to Halloween coming up at the end of the week as well. That's going to be fun. Um, all around in a good mood, I think. I'm very well. How are you, Danny? And yes, Periscope. Periscope can be a bit wonky sometimes, but we'll fight through. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Happy Monday. Come in, come in, come in, come in. We'll give another couple of minutes before we get started. I'm running a wee bit late this evening, but it's all good. All good. We'll get there in the end. Yes, I'm scoping. Absolutely. Wild horses couldn't turn me away. I am very well. Thank you, Sarah. Very well. Indeed, had a good weekend. It's getting a wee bit chilly now, but not too chilly. I'm realising that I really need to shave looking in this periscope thing. It's just a constant mirror. Um, I finished, I finished reading, where did I, where did I, where's my book? D, who sometimes pops in here. I finished reading D's book, uh, Sons of Avalon, which is about a young Merlin, which is fab. Um, we're not we're not deliberately trying to go for a uh, swashbuckling and smiting Danny. It, it's more of a fact that the number one thing that I hate to do in life is I hate shaving. Um, it drives me nuts, and I would grow a massive beard um, if I could grow a massive beard. But unfortunately, what happens is it gets to this length, uh, and then it, it just sits like this length. Um, even if I then wait four or five months from this point, it will never grow beyond this, uh, which makes me very sad. Um, I would prefer to have a Gandalf-sized beard. I, uh, I'm glad you think the length is fine, so I'm glad. Either way, it's it's coming off tomorrow. Um, she says, realizing it's 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 definitely definitely coming off in the morning. Um, it won't be hanging around after that. Too many, too many birthdays waking up um, hoping that I've grown a full length beard, being disappointed. And now I just, now I just go and nip the thing in the bud. Hello, Kathy, hello, come in, come in, come in. Come in, sit down, Kathy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? I think, I think then shall we get into tonight's show? Hello, hello. Well, per Periscope, you know, it's a Monday. Periscope is known for its issues. We'll, we'll forgive it. Which sheriff of Nottingham, though, Danny? That's the question. If I was going to be any sheriff, I think I'd be Alan Rickman, sheriff of Nottingham. That's my favourite. But... <laughs> well, I, I, do you know what? If my cat goes out, I'll understand that's why. Wow. Now you're just making me feel bad, Kathy. Four thousand. That's that's impressive. Well, we've got three, but it's quality over quantity, uh, and I will happily, happily take you, Danny, and Kathy, and Sarah any time. Yes, yes. Even I am willing to admit that Alan Rickman is drop dead sexy. Yeah, Alan Rickman in that film. Whew. I get a hot flush if you don't watch it. Anyway, speaking of hot flushes, let's get to some romance with Sir Tristram. As last week, we kind of wrapped up Sir Tristram's gallivanting with the ladies of the court of King Mark. As he went off and chased down Sir Segrade's wife, believing himself to be God's gift to women. And that if he went and rescued this lady from Sir Blobris, that she would give herself unto him. After all, why not? He's a pretty snazzy knight. But uh, it seems that the wife of Sir Segrade wanted a bit more than a snazzy knight. And actually wanted someone with the courtly chivalry to have chased after her immediately. 
and not to have sat waiting around in the court of King Mark for other knights to try to rescue her first. Fair play to her! But tonight, tonight, ladies and gents, we will return to the court of King Mark and the Lady Assault for... As you guys well know, when Sir Tristram was injured after his first fight with a knight, he went over to the court of King Anguish in Ireland, badly wounded by poison at the time, and there he was rescued, saved, healed by King Mark's daughter, the Lady Isolde. But... When King Mark discovered that Sir Tristram had killed his brother-in-law, Sir Marus, Sir Tristram was made to leave Ireland and return to Cornwall. And now, ladies and gents, we rejoin Tristram in Cornwall as we look at what happens when news of the Lady Assault is told by Tristram unto King Mark. Ladies and gents! Even though it's only a quiet... Actually, I've seen ladies and gents. It's all ladies tonight. Ladies! Ladies of the court! Shall we get into tonight's episode of Limor Dartha? I think so. It is ladies night. I feel slightly uncomfortable the fact that I'm doing ladies night. It's like you're expecting me to do some kind of Chippendale routine and start stripping out of a suit of armour, which we won't be doing because... Uh, I just don't have a suit of armour or any kind of music to go along with that kind of routine. So we'll do the story instead. Then, when this was done, King Mark cast always in his heart that he might destroy Sir Tristram for being so popular with the women of the court. And he imagined in himself to send Sir Tristram to Ireland to fetch the Lady Assault. For Sir Tristram had so praised her beauty and her goodness that King Mark said he would wed her, whereupon he prayed Sir Tristram to take his way into Ireland for him on message, and all this was done to the intent of slaying Sir Tristram. Notwithstanding, Sir Tristram would not refuse the message, for no danger or pebble that might fall for the pleasure of his uncle, but to go he made himself ready in the most goodly way that might be devised. For Sir Tristram took with him the most goodliest knights that he could find in the court, and they were arrayed after the guise that was then used in the goodliest manner. And so Sir Tristram departed and took the sea with all his fellowship, and anon, as he was in the broad sea, a tempest took him and his fellowship as well, and he drove them all back to the coast of England. And there they arrived fast by Camelot, and were forced to take land. And when they had landed, Sir Tristram set up his pavilion upon the land of Camelot, and there he let hang his shield upon that pavilion. And that same day came two knights of Arthur's. One was Sir Hector de Marie, the other Sir Morganor. And they touched the shield and bade Sir Tristram to come out of the pavilion to joust with them if he would joust. <laughs> You shall be answered, said Sir Tristram, and you will tarry a little while. And so he made himself ready, and then, coming out of the court, coming out onto his horse to face off with these knights in a field of jousting, he readied his shield, ready his spear, rode together, came together like thunder, and so first smote down Sir Hector de Marie, and after turning, he rode again, rode towards Sir Morgan, and... Again, smote down Sir Morganor, all with a single spear, and sorely bruised them both. And when they lay upon the earth, they asked Sir Tristram what he was, and of what country he was a knight. Fair lord, said Tristram, know ye well that I am of Cornwall? <laughs> Alas, said Sir Hector, now I am ashamed that ever a Cornish knight should overcome me. And then, for despite, Sir Hector put off his armour from him and went on foot. 
and the word not ride. There we have it, ladies and gents. Halfway through tonight's tale, King Mark, sorely jealous of how popular Sir Tristram is with the ladies of the court, has devised a plan to send Sir Tristram to Ireland to fetch back the Lady Isolde, claiming that he would wed her. But in doing so, this is just a ruse. It's the plan of King Mark that in sending Tristram to Ireland, he would have him executed. He would have succeeded, it seems, if not bad storms blew Sir Tristram back into the land of Camelot in England. There, for him to face off against two knights of King Arthur's court, to have succeeded in battle against them, and now... Now to be resting upon his laurels, near to the court of Arthur. Then it fell that Sir Blobris and Sir Blamore de Gany, that were brethren, had summoned the King Anguish of Ireland to come to Arthur's court upon pain of forfeiture of King Arthur's good grace. And if the King of Ireland did not come in at the day assigned, and set the king, then he should lose his hands. Lands! Sorry, I was stuck at Andy there and said lands. It's a hand. He's going to lose his lands. Hello, Andy! So by it happened that at the day assigned, King Arthur and Sir Lancelot might not be there to give the judgment. For King Arthur was with Sir Lancelot at the castle Joyous Guard. And so... King Arthur assigned King Carados and the King of Scots to be there that day as judges, so that when the kings were at Camelot, King Anguish of Ireland came to know his accusers. Then there was Sir Blamore de Gany, who repelled the King of Ireland of treason, and he had slain a cousin of his in his court in Ireland by treason as well. The king was surely abashed of this accusation. For why? He was come at the summons of King Arthur, and or he came at Camelot, he wist not wherefore he was sent after. And when the king heard Sir Blamor say his will, he understood well that there was no other remedy but to answer him knightly. For the custom was such in those days that any man who repelled of any treason or murder he should fight body for body, or else find another knight for him. And all manner of murderers in those days were called treason. And so, when King Anguish understood his accusing, he was passing heavy. For he knew that Sir Blamor de Gany was a noble knight, and of noble knights come. Then... The king of Ireland was simply pervaded of his answer, and therefore the judges gave him a spite by the third day to reply. So, the king. Oh, I do apologise. I'm yawning. So the king departed unto his lodging. The meanwhile there came a lady by Sir Tristram's pavilion, who made a great do. What aileth you, said Sir Tristram, that you make such do? Ah, fair knight, said the lady, I am ashamed, unless some good knight could help me. For a great lady of worship was sent by me, a fair child, unto Sir Lancelot the Lake. And hereby they met with me a knight who threw me down from my horse and took the child away from me. Well, said Sir Tristram, and for my lord Sir Lancelot's sake, I shall get you that child again, or else I shall be defeated in it. And so Sir Tristram took his horse and asked the lady which way the knight rode. And then she told him, and he rode after him. And within a while he overtook the knight. And then Sir Tristram bade him turn, crying, Give me again that child. And we end tonight's story there, ladies and gentlemen, with King Anguish of Ireland called to the court of King Arthur to answer for treason and the murder most foul. And Sir Tristram, having discovered 
a child who was sent to say Lancelot the Lake has been kidnapped to Tristram riding off to rescue. Yes, cliffhanger, Sarah. Cliffhanger's the best way to end it. Also, um, I had a bit of a rough night last night, so um, I'm flagging a tiny bit with my energy tonight. And if we're going to get into Sir Tristram rescuing a child, slaying knights right, left and centre... But I want to be on best form. So we'll end, end Lame World Dartha there for tonight on that cliffhanger. Tomorrow night, we'll see what happens when Sir Tristram goes to rescue that knight and Sir Anguish, and not Sir Anguish, King Anguish is made to answer for his crimes, allegedly, of treason and murder. Welcome to the week, ladies and gents. We're off to a fine start, I think. You're very, very welcome, Charles. Hello, Queen. Hello, Andy. You're welcome. You're welcome, guys. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Please do. Please do join again for tomorrow when we see just what happens to that good old knight, Sir Tristram. It's going to get very bloody this week, ladies and gents. It will get very bloody indeed. There is slaying and the smiting and the buffeting to come. You're welcome, Queen. I'm looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Um, like I said, this is my, my favourite series of tales uh, from the Mort Arthur. So, in for some good stuff, I can promise you. I can't wait! <laughs> You already went left and centre. I can't wait for that. I will, Andy. I've got. I'm going to go and do some poetry. Oh, perhaps when we finish doing Le Mort Darthur, we might do some Homer, and we're reluctant to start doing another big tranche of um, poetry. I oh, some poetry of a saga. But, but, Andy. But here's the but. What I might do, um, because in it will come. So Andy, I, I I'm loving reading these things. It will come. The Odyssey is one of my favourite sagas. But what I might do um, for Poetry Live in uh, ten minutes' time, I might go and grab one of the volumes of the Odyssey from downstairs and treat you um, to some highlights from the Odyssey. How about that? In 10 minutes time, we'll go in Poetry Live and I will go and do some highlights from the Odyssey from Homer. And Bukowski, won't we? I have promised Bukowski. We'll do Bukowski tomorrow. We'll do Homer tonight, Bukowski tomorrow. How does that sound, Queen? I, I like, I like that. Bit of classical to start us off, then we'll go massively into the future. Do Bukowski tomorrow night. I think that's a nice bit of contrast. Um, that could be quite fun. Um, anyway, I, I will go then, ladies and gents. Um, I will go and grab my Homer for tonight. And I'll see you guys back here in eight minutes or so as we get into doing Poetry Live and get cracking with some Homer. I'll go and pick some nice scenes. I think I know what I want to do already. Excellent.